Many arguments for and against the legalization of abortion blurs the most basic and central issue, which is human life and dignity. When we lose sight of this, all discussions are merely distractions from the very purpose why we're even discussing the issue in abortion. Really, the only question worth asking and answering in a primary discussion about abortion is this. What are the unborn? Is the unborn a human person or not? That's literally the only question that matters. All primary discussion about abortion must be aimed at answering that question. This is Sir David Jard Casaneda, co-founder and president of the Association of Catholic Apologists, Knights of St. Justin Martyr. Welcome to Apolihia Davao. <laughs> I remember when I was writing an argumentative research paper for a general education subject uh, last semester, my teammate and I chose the topic on abortion. And when we presented the, legal, the, the arguments against uh, the legalization of abortion in front of the class, that was a uh, proposal, uh, a time for proposing arguments, the reaction of our instructor uh, was to say that the arguments that we presented are typical arguments against abortion and are therefore weak. But you know what the arguments are? What the arguments were? It is basically this. The life of an innocent individual, a human person, will be terminated if abortion is legalized. Hence, abortion should not be legalized because it terminates the life of an innocent, individual, human person. And 
our instructor in that class called that argument weak. And note that that instructor teaches at a Catholic university and that instructor thinks that protecting an innocent human life is a weak argument. And so it took the remainder of our time for the class and some a few minutes on the on her on the time of her next uh, class to discuss why our proposal research proposal should be accepted and the only time that she accepted our argumentative research paper proposal was when i asked her this simple question um, that she did not really answer in the end so i asked her and she evaded the, the, to, uh, to answer she evaded the question i asked her this and quote imagine if our culture today supports child sacrifice to the gods in exchange for individual and communal flourishing that is to say in order to get good crops next year we have to sacrifice two-year-old kids in an altar table i asked her would you still say that the argument that it should not be supported because it terminates the life of an innocent individual human person weak there was no response no answer to that question she just said okay you can write that argumentative research paper but i think that her response to the group who presented before us is far more telling as to the extent of her knowledge about the issue on abortion how is that um well the group before us also chose abortion as their topic and her comments was that their arguments are great not to say that there that those uh, classmates of mine did not write their paper well i think the paper is actually well written but i'd say as far as this i think their paper misses the point the reason why i think that is because their arguments did not focus on the question on whether or not the aborted unborn is a living human for per person or not or i mean uh, their arguments did not focus around the question on whether or not the unborn is a living human person or not rather they focus their arguments on issues surrounding abortion that doesn't really tackle the main issue arguments like economic circumstances personal choice unwanted pregnancies and unsafe abortion and their refutation of the pro life case also misses the point when they characterize the pro life case as merely rooted in religion which not all people ascribe to well i th think that we can make a pro life case that is not based in religion but they did not respond to that um to those possible non religious pro life case in their paper but i think that overall their paper is well written uh they also mentioned that abortion should be legalized because it saves women from life threatening pregnancy complications like ectopic pregnancy but i do not think that this is an argument to legalize abortion because although some would think some would call that kind of uh um process of removing a child um because of the ectopic pregnancy 
actually it's not even removing a child it's removing a part uh, of the body that ruptured because there there is a a growing embryo inside that part of the body uh, although some would call it therapeutic abortion i do not think that it is the same as the abortion that people are pushing right now in the legislation or at least will be pushing or possibly will possibly be pushed uh, into the legislation assuming that we will v- the, the elected president in the 2022 presidential elections will be a pro-choice candidate. Um, but in any case, I do not think that therapeutic abortion is the same as the abortion that we want to push. Or at least, they do not have the same moral value. More about that on future videos. Um, for Right now, let's focus on this important topic. Well, these classmates of mine are informal representatives of the pro-choice or pro-abortion advocacy. I think that in majority of cases, we hear the same arguments for the legalization of abortion. In fact, in the recent presidential candidates' interviews, we hear the argument that abortion should be a matter of choice because her body, her choice. We also hear responses to pro-life candidates that their position is merely religious. Um, And I also think that those call-outs are true, however. Some candidates are merely basing their answer only to their religious belief. And as good as that might be, to to have your politics in line with your religious moral beliefs, I do not think that those arguments work. And I do think that those arguments should not be used by pro-life advocates in the Congress, in the Senate, for example, during hearings. I think that you can use those arguments if you're talking to another religious person. But I do not think that in a secular discussion that anyone should use those arguments in a a secular discussion. I do not think that that would work or I do do not even think that 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 um, improves the pro-life position. I would say that the central argument that pro-life advocates must use is the argument that at the moment of conception, the unborn is a whole, living, and distinct human organism, and that by virtue of this being human, the unborn has the inherent rights and dignity of a human person. Thus, on the grounds of life and dignity, abortion should not be legalized. This means that the issue that we need to tackle is the issue on the status of the unborn, both as an individual human being and as a human person. In the book Precious Unborn Human Persons, Greg Kuckel writes, and I quote, If the unborn is a hum- is not a human person, no justification for abortion is necessary. However, if the unborn is a human person, no justification for abortion is adequate. Close quote. This is the reason why pro-abortion, pro-choice advocates would reject the fact that an individual human life is formed at conception. Because if an individual human person is formed at the moment of conception, then no justification for abortion is adequate. But this is also the reason why the only thing that pro-life advocates must prove in a secular discussion about abortion is that at the moment of conception, a living, whole human or uh, human organism is formed, and hence the unborn is a human person that should be protected under the law. Why is it important to prove that the unborn are living, whole human organisms? I have two reasons why this particular um, thing should be proven. Proven in a primary discussion about abortion. Number one, because there are pro-abortion, pro-choice advocates who do not know that the unborn are not just clump of cells, but are babies. Sometimes you would hear someone argue uh, that, for example, I am against abortion at around the time when the unborn already looks like a baby. 
But if it just looks like blood or a clump of cells, then I'm fine with that. I think that this kind of pro-abortion, pro-choice uh, advocate grounds his tolerance of abortion based on how the unborn child looks like. If it looks like a human being, then abortion is evil. If, it not, if not, the abortion can be tolerated. I do, I do not think that our law should be grounded on our subjective perception of what a thing is, depending on what the thing looks like for us. I think that our law must be grounded in a solid foundation of an understanding of what that thing is really is so but i think this view the view that if it looks like a human being then abortion is evil if not then abortion can be tolerated i think that view is rooted in the idea that what looks like a human being is most probably a human being and thus has the right to to life as all human beings have so if we are able to convince if we are able to convince them that the unborn are living, whole, human organisms, even at a certain point in their development, they do not really look like a human being, or sometimes at some point of their development, they do look like another organism, then we might be able to convince them that the, that abortion shouldn't be legalized at all. But my second reason, and a more important reason as to why I think proving that the unborn is are the unborn are living whole human organisms is important is that if we are able to establish that the un, unborn are living whole human organisms then the pro abortion pro choice advocates has the burden to prove why even if the unborn is a human being they do not have the same legal status as those who are born human being. Note, I say, I only say same legal stat, uh, legal status because we are really uh, discussing more specifically about the legalization of abortion. But I would say that regardless of the legal status, recog- uh, the legal status of something recognized by the state, human persons have inherent rights that the states cannot take away. So regardless of of the legal status recognized by the states, uh, I think that we have inherent rights that the states cannot take away. Because our rights, though recognized by the states or by the state, does not really come from the state, not at all. It is inherent Rather, it is inherent in the fact that we are human persons. The difference is that if we say, if we say over and over again that our rights come from the states, then the state given uh, has the right to take it away. So I wouldn't say that the state, the states or, or individual states are giving us the rights rather i would say that we already have our inherent rights and it must be recognized by the state so that is a very important distinction so now let us first clarify most of the times pro-choice and pro-life advocates disagree about when life begins so this is now the first part of proving that the, that the unborn is a living, whole human organism. The first step is to prove that life begins at conception. The reason for this disagreement between pro-choice and pro-life advocates is that the pro-life advocates consider this question as a scientific question, uh, while pro-choice considers this as a philosophical question. So we need to distinguish between those two, and when we are asked that particular question, we must be careful to distinguish the scientific and philosophical aspect of the question. So scientifically, the question on when life begins is a question on the start of the existence of a human organism. Philosophically, the question when life begins is about when a human organism has intrinsic value 
a right to life and the status of a person. While pro-life advocates has a consensus that these two sides of the question are answerable by the same answer, that is, life begins at the moment of conception, the pro-choice advocates, uh, advocates may disagree. So it is important to have an idea about how to, responds, uh, how to respond to such objections. So in this video, we're going to tackle the scientific side of the question. When is the beginning of a human organism? Pro-life advocates like myself would answer that it is at the moment of conception. But uh, this means that we need to prove that the unborn is at the moment of conception a live human and whole organisms. So we need to ask, are the unborn alive? I think there are two responses to this question. The first one is a more of a, a an active answer. The second one is more of a reactive answer. Um, in any case, these are both, both valid responses. First is that there is a scientific consensus that if something is growing by cellular reproduction, if something metabolizes, that is converting food into energy, and if something is responsive to stimuli, then it is alive. The unborn are alive because they receive nutrients from their mother, and by this, the unborn grows via cellular reproduction. So they are alive by that. Um, there are some objections as to specifics on this, but we may tackle that in future videos. For now, this is just outlining what the general responses are. Second, if the unborn is not alive, this is now the more reactive um, response to the, to the question. If the unborn is not alive, then why is there a need to abort it? After all, what does abortion do to the fetus? What abortion does is to uh, does to the fetus is to kill it. Even if some pro-abortion, pro-choice advocates um, would claim that it is not killing it, rather it is just removing it from the womb of the mother. Still, we can ask: Doesn't removing it from the womb of the mother eventually kill it? And if that something dies? Isn't it necessary that it is alive at some point before its death? So meaning, in these two responses, we are able to establish that the unborn are really living inside the womb uh, of the mother. So the qu second question is this, are the unborn human? So we can address this question philosophically. What? Uh, philosophically, what does human mean? When are we able to say that that specific organism has the right, uh, inherent right and dignity, etc.? But while this question is often answered philosophically, there are some who would ask this question as a biological question. So we need to ask always, are you referring or are you asking this in a philosophical sense or are you asking this in a biological sense? There are two types of evidences that to answer uh, whether the unborn are biologically human or not. The first is we can ask what kind of organism the parents of the fetus in question are. So if the parents of the fetus in question are cats, then the fetus is a cat. However, if the parents are biologically human, then of course it follows that the fetus is human. The second evidence involves the genetic code or DNA. I think if the fetus possesses a human genetic code, then the fetus is a human being. And so I think that the, the confusion in this particular question coming from, coming from the pro-choice, pro-abortion advocates is the term fetus. Because some would say that fetus, the fetus is not a human or fetuses and humans are different. Uh, because maybe because the, they say that humans are born, fetuses are not yet born. But even uh, the term fetus indicates that it is human. Most medical dictionaries among humans says that fetus refers to a human being at the eighth week of life until birth. Meaning that the word fetus refers to a stage of development in the life of a human being. Much like when we say that a 
that organism is a toddler. That human organism is a toddler. That human organism is a teenager, a young adult, a, even a senior citizen, if we if we say. Uh, so, the word fetus then is not a word that is used to refer to something that is not human. Rather, it refers to a human being at the stage, at that stage of development, uh, at that particular stage of development, so we can call it a fetus. So meaning it, it is referring to, to a human being at a particular stage of development, much like we refer to toddlers as those that are between ages of 1 to 3, or uh, I'm not really sure what age bracket uh, do we use to refer um, kids as uh, toddlers. In any case, the, fa the fact is that fetus is a word used to refer to a human being at a certain stage of development in, the li in, in life. So, the third important question is, are the unborn organisms, that is, are the unborns whole organisms or are they merely parts, parts of the mother that, uh, or I'm, I'm not really sure how they use this particular question. Um, some would say that even though the fetus is alive and human, it is nothing like every cell in our body. This is so because, like the fetus, every cell in my body is alive and human. Now, their question is, is every cell in my body a human being? Pro-choice, pro-abortion advocates would then say, so, if abortion is murder because we are removing a clump of cells outside the womb of the, of the mother and that clump of cell dies, is masturbation then gen genocide? Because what masturbation does is to remove many sperm cells, many living human sperm cells outside of the body, and then those sperm cells die. So is it genocide? While masturbation is another moral evil and is a disordered act, masturbation is not at all genocide. The problem with that pro-choice, pro-abortion argument that masturbation is maybe genocide is that or, or the premise of that uh, question is that sperms are parts of a whole and not in itself a whole meaning the argument confuses parts and wholes just because some things have some common traits it doesn't mean that they are of the same kind of thing so it doesn't mean that sperm egg and all somatic cells uh, are living and we can say human that it doesn't mean that they are already human beings because they might be they might have common traits but they also have they may have other different traits so sperm egg and all somatic cells are parts of the human body but they are not whole human beings in contrast a fetus is a human being that is capable of developing over time into a mature member of that particular species. That is something that parts does not have. The capability to develop into a mature member of that species. Because sperms do not become, sperms alone do not become human organisms. They are parts of a human organism, but they are not in themselves human organisms. So, now, when we distinguish between parts and wholes, what we're actually distinguish, distinguishing are parts of an organism and the organism itself. So, we need to ask, what is an organism then? So, I would use the same definition that Trent Horn uses in his book, Persuasive Pro-Life. He says that an organism is a collection of biological parts or organs that function together to sustain the existence of a whole being that possesses the qualities of life. So sperm, egg, skin cells are not in themselves organisms because they cannot sustain the existence of a whole being that possesses the qualities 
of life. Trantor also uses a so-called organism test, wherein he would ask if I can give this living thing time, nutrition, and a proper environment, would it be able to develop towards becoming a mature member of its species? Then, if the answer is yes, Trentorn would say that it is an organism and not a mere body part. So, since an unborn child, when given time, nutrition, and a proper environment, in this case, uh, in, in the case of the unborn, the environment of the uterus, will develop into a mature human being if he does not die prematurely. So, an unborn child, because if we give it time, nutrition, proper environment, uh, since it will develop into a mature human being if he does not die prematurely, then that, then the unborn is a whole organism. But you may ask, why is it really important to prove that the unborn are whole organisms? Well, this is because some would argue that they are just clump of cells and not a new individual human organism. Um, that is, meaning it does not really has the same status of person or it does not really have the same dignity as those that are not just clump of cells. And this is also partly the reason behind the idea that mother that that a mother can abort the fetus because it's her body, her choice. But the problem is that even though it looks like simply a clump of cells, it is not really just a clump of cells. Embryologist E. L. Potter says that every time a sperm cell and an ovum unite, a new being is created which is alive and will continue to live unless its death is brought about by some specific conditions. So meaning it's naturally oriented towards developing into a mature member of its species. Uh, and that happens every time a sperm cell and an ovum unite. So during the moment of fertilization, what happens is that the sperm cell and ovum does not become static. Rather, it starts developing little by little towards... Um, becoming a mature member of its species. So, the unborn, even a second after the sperm cell and ovum unite, are not just tissues or body parts like sperm cells, egg cells, or ovum, or skin cells. They are not, uh, rather they are a separate um, living orga or human organism. And they are also not uh, like cancerous tumors, which can grow and sprout body parts like hair or teeth, uh, because those cancerous tumors do not have the potential to develop into an adult human. For, for instance, um, there is a, a tumor, or um, probably it's, it is cancerous, uh, it's called HeLa cells, that they are giving time, nutrient, and a proper environment, and it keeps growing and growing, but even no matter how much time, how much nutrient, how, how ideal the conditions and environment that we put it in, it does not develop into an adult human being. It remains merely as a cancerous tumor or uh, a cancerous tumor. So when we determine what something is, we ground it into its nature. That is the identity that remains even when that something undergoes development or change. Grounding what something is into its nature also means that we ask to what end is it oriented to. So, since the fetus or embryo, even when it looks just like a clump of cells, is oriented towards developing into a mature human being, then the fetus or embryo really is a human being. But as to what, that, uh, what the consequences of that particular statement is, uh, that will be tackled more on the next video. So, for now, I hope that you learned something from this video. If you have anything to share, like conversations with pro-choice advocates, or um, if you have any questions, clarifications, or objections, the Justinian community, our community, in the Association of Catholic Apologists are very happy to engage you in a dialogue. 
just comment down below or message us in our page so that we can uh, so that it will notify us that you have a message or a comment also please don't forget to like and share this video and other videos that we've created so far because that would help us get our message across and in this crucial time we really need to spread the message that the pro-life argument is not simply a religious argument or, or it does not necessitate you becoming Catholic, for instance. It only needs you to be human, to be an instance of a rational nature. So please help us get this message across. Also, don't forget to like and follow our Facebook page, Apologia Devao, and subscribe in our YouTube channel, Association of uh, Catholic Apologists, and share to your friends, to your family, what you just learned uh, in this video. Because it will really help not just us in getting our message across, it, it will also help you in the way that you can engage pro-choice advocates or in, in defending the pro-life position, but it also helps your families and friends. So I hope that you, you've learned something in this video. And again, this is Sir Raven Jard Castaneda, co-founder and president of the Association of Catholic Apologists, Knights of St. Justin Martyr. May God bless you and always keep you safe and see you in our next video. Sancte Michael Archangel Defende nos in prelio Contra le cuizia Et in Yeah.